Before we begin with today's episode, I would like to provide you with some context in light of the school attack that occurred last week on Valentine's Day. Dr. Perodin and I recorded this interview back in August of last year. This episode contains graphic content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. We just all sitting there in the library and then they just started, all you hear is like firecrackers. And then I looked out the window and there's a kid with a trench coat and a shotgun throwing pipe bombs in the parking lot. And then he shot a girl outside. And then he came into the cafeteria and you could hear like bombs and shotguns going off. And then he came into the library and shot everybody around me. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Welcome to episode 11 of the show that takes you beyond the headlines. As the world mourns yet another mass shooting, thoughts and prayers from around the world are being sent to the family and friends of the victims of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. In the coming weeks, We are going to be inundated with information, some of it truth, some of it conjecture. And it's only through the passage of time that the false narratives will be panned from the truth. We will hear theories as to why our politicians have failed us, and many experts are going to posit reasons as to why this happened again. We will be bombarded with statistics, and we will be shown how around the world gun violence is almost non-existent. Both sides of the gun debate will trot out their experts, providing us with a decision to make, either for or against, and interject the cause of your choice. We have all seen this before. This is what happened 19 years ago in Littleton, Colorado, in the aftermath of the Columbine school attack. Most people have heard of the Columbine school attack. There are thousands of documents, dozens of video and audio clips, and a few documentaries. During the first part of this episode, we are going to take a retrospective look at the events of April 20th, 1999. This story has been scrutinized every which way. There have been many things learned from this tragedy, some of which Dr. Perodin will share with us today. This episode will unfold in two parts. Dr. Perodin will take us through what we've learned about the Columbine school attack and how it's changed our preparedness. And then we will examine some frightening similarities of the events leading up to the attack at Columbine and the attack at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High Schools. Specifically, we will be examining a lesson that some have learned, but at the same time, others have not and the consequences are devastating. Stay with me. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold are seared into everybody's mind. And, uh, you know, it's a duo. So when we think about an active shooter situation, school attack, we think the lone attacker, because that's typically how it happens. And this was a duo. Um, and it was, it, it, this didn't, you know, if, if you think of, of, a, of a mold 
and again, there is there is not a profile for a school shooter. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But but this didn't fit fit the mold. Um, so let's talk a little bit about first the the event, Columbine High School Massacre, April twentieth, nineteen ninety nine. Eric Harris, Dylan Klebold, two students at the school, ended up killing 13 people uh, before taking their own lives. Sue Klebold, Dylan's mother, describes how the day began. It was still dark. The house was black. And I heard Dylan thundering down the stairs in his boots because his bedroom was upstairs and ours was down. And I was startled because it was too early for him to be up. And I uh, opened my bedroom door and I yelled, Dill? And he had run past my room down the stairs, and he was at the front door. And I couldn't see him, but all I heard him say was, bye, and then he slammed the door and left. And I was very concerned. I woke my husband immediately and said, something is bothering him. You know, would you be home today? Will you talk with him? And my husband worked out of our home, and he said, yes, I'll, I'll be home. I'll be home all day. I'll talk to him when he gets home. Sue Klebold would not see her son alive again. On the morning of Tuesday, April 20th, 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold placed a small firebomb in a field about three miles south of Columbine High School and approximately two miles south of the fire station. It was set to explode at 11.14 a.m. The bomb was intended as a diversion to draw firefighters and emergency personnel away from the school. At 11.10 a.m., Harris and Klebold arrived separately at Columbine High School. Harris parked his vehicle in the junior student parking lot by the south entrance, and Klebold parked in the senior student parking lot by the west entrance. The school cafeteria, their primary bomb target, was between their parking spots. The duo walked into the cafeteria with duffel bags containing two 20-pound propane bombs. The bombs were set on a timer. The time was set to detonate at 11.17 a.m. at the height of the A lunch shift. After leaving the bombs underneath some tables, they walked back to their vehicles to await the blast. At 11.19 a.m., police dispatch received the call about an explosion. This was the diversionary bomb that the duo had placed earlier in the day. Picture South, you know, it's a report of a, what appears to be an explosion. It sounded like an explosion. Northbound on watch was between Chatfield and Kent Carroll. The fire department's been advised. At this same moment, the duo, now impatient because the cafeteria bombs didn't go off, armed themselves and the massacre was underway. As they walked towards the cafeteria, they began firing at students in their way, killing and wounding all that were in their path. At 11.23 a.m., police dispatch received the call. Go ahead. We have a female down in the south lot of Columbine High School. It's the south lower lot at the east end of the lot. I don't know if this is related to this explosion. Columbine High School lot. Shots fired at Columbine. Yeah. Attention, Falcon, it's a possible shots fired at Columbine High School 16. 
5201 South Pierce, possibly in the south lower lot towards the east end. One female is down. As law enforcement raced toward the scene, the duo was continuing their onslaught. They were tossing pipe bombs and firing their guns at anything that moved. At this moment, art teacher Patty Nielsen noticed the commotion outside and walked toward the duo with the intent to tell them to, quote, knock it off, end quote. She believed it was a student prank or possibly a video being filmed. As she approached the door, Shots were fired through the glass, injuring her and another student. Patty stood up and ran towards the library, warning students along the way to take cover and to be silent. At 11.25 a.m., she dialed 911. Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher called by high school. There is a student here with a gun. He was shot out a window. I believe one of them had shot. Um, yeah, um, I've been calling by high school. I don't know what's in my shoulder. If it was just a last me too, but... Um, okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down on the table, kids. Um, kids are screaming, some of the teachers um, are, you know, trying to take control of it. We need police here. We need okay, to we're getting them there. Who is the student, ma'am? I do not know who the student is. Okay. I saw a student outside. I was in hold and hold and Okay, I was on hold and I saw a gun. I said, what's going on out there? And he said, oh, it's probably for video production. It's probably a joke. I said, well, I don't think that's a good idea. And I went walking outside. I said, he was <laughs> See what was going on. And he turned the gun straight at us and shot us. And my God, the window went out. And the kid standing there with me, I think he got hit. Okay. Something in my shoulder. Okay. We've got help on the way, ma'am. Stay in the line with me. We need to know what's going on. Okay. Okay. I am on the floor. Okay. And you've okay. got the kids in the there. Library. And I've got every student in this library on the floor. You better stay on the floor. Is there any way you can lock the doors? Um, smoke is coming in from out there, and I'm a little bit. Okay. The gun is right outside the library door. Okay. I don't think I'm going to go out there. Okay. okay. You're okay. calling my high school. I got, I got three children. Okay. We got it. Okay. I'm going to go to the door to shut the door. Okay. I've got the kids on the floor. Um, I got all the kids in the library on the We have paramedics, we have fire, and we have police on route, okay, sir? Okay. Okay. Yes. This, I mean, right. he's, I, I don't know. This, I can't know. believe he's not out of bullets. He just keeps shooting and shooting and shooting. Okay. Yeah, we've got a police officer on scene. I thought it was. Okay, just try and keep the kids in the library calm. Yeah. Is there any way you can block the door so no one can get in? I do, I do not. Okay. I, yeah, I guess I can try to go, but I mean, he's right outside that door. I'm afraid to go to the door. That's okay. That's where he is. I'm afraid okay. to go there. Okay? That's okay. Okay, I told the kids to get on the floor. I had to go the table. All of the children are on the floor under the table. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, they're all under the table. Okay. And, and I, as long as we can just try and keep... No one's saying a word. Okay, as long as we can keep everyone there as calm as we can. Sure. I hear some yelling out there going on right yeah, now. Yeah, we've got alarms going off now as well. Yeah, there's alarms. This room is filled with smoke. Okay. Okay. Keep everyone low to the floor. 
Patty laid the phone down to find a better hiding spot. The call lasted 26 minutes, capturing the worst of the attack. At 12.08 p.m., the duo ended their attack by committing suicide. Twelve students and one teacher were murdered, and 21 others were injured. Around the time the duo was committing suicide, Dylan's mother was just finding out about the attack. About noon, I was getting ready to go to a meeting. I worked uh, for the community college system. And I had left my desk and came back and the message light was flashing on my telephone. And I thought, well, I better listen to this. I picked up the phone and listened. And it was my husband's voice and he sounded horribly upset. His voice was cracking. He could hardly breathe. And he said, listen to the television. Something horrible is happening at school. There, it was such a day of confusion. Uh, we had, police came to our home. We were asked to leave our home. We had to sit outside. We sat on the ground all day. We could hear through the window the television that had been left on. And at one point we heard 25 people are dead. And I remember at that point thinking, you know, if Dylan is really doing this, he must stop. And, and at that moment is when I really, um, I prayed for him to die. I mean, I, I thought he's, something has got to stop this. This is whatever it is that's going on. It took me a very long time to believe, months to believe that my son was actually responsible for killing and hurting people. Up until that time, I believe I was living in a, a really an extreme state of denial, just saying he really, he was there, but he didn't really kill anybody or, you know, he wasn't what they're saying. It had to be Eric. I have this feeling of wanting to say over and over again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I know that such a thing is so completely inadequate but I don't know what else to say besides I'm sorry. I'm just so sorry for what Dylan did.
Dr. Perodin gives us some insight into Eric and Dylan. So when, when Dylan and Eric would be questioned about these behaviors or things that they have written and things like that, they, they had the appropriate responses. They, they, they um, were very mature in their responses. They would dress appropriately, like if they were before, um, if they were being questioned by their parents or, or before officials, that they, they yeah, I mean, they, they completely knew how to game the, the system, what to say, um, you know, so it was just, you know, th- these are kids and, and, yeah, this is extreme. But, you know, at the same time, both of them worked at Blackjack Pizza. They held jobs. And um, what was it? Harris was even promoted up to uh, shift manager. So, so they had jobs. They participated in school events. And even though, you know, and you pointed out the video, and I think the video is very in- interesting where they, the, you know, they, you know, and they would probably be what we would consider our early version of tech geeks. I mean, both of them were, were very much um, into engineering, into computers, um, but also you know, kind of, kind of viewed not as, not as like geeks or, or, or freaks quote on quote, you know, kind of a, a little bit aloof, but I mean, they attended some things, uh, some school events. And if you're walking down the hallway at Columbine, uh, as a student, you would probably be more aware or maybe more intimidated by somebody dressed all in goth, you know, black and, and some of the chains than, than if Dylan or Eric walked by you, I mean, it, it was very interesting. You know, part of it was they saw themselves as vindicating those that had been bullied and they, they were, they didn't see themselves probably as much as victims of bullying, although they had people didn't, as you said, you know, were, were making fun of some of the things, but they were pretty arrogant. Like they kind of brushed some of that stuff off and, but they saw themselves as vindicating. Like they were going to come in and, and they were going to cleanse this, this, you know, this ill, this this uh, unjust atmosphere that that they perceived um, happening, you know, um, which also is very interesting because we see that later with Adam Lanza in 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 2012 of of something very similar. So um, so we see almost we see almost this um, this this vindicated warrior of, approach of you know they're they're going to step in and make this this statement very very disturbing that they would do that. After Columbine, schools were looking for answers as to how to prevent these attacks from happening again. Many were questioning the implementation of drills, whether or not they could be used to inform the attackers about an emergency response. So some questions came up. Now, everybody knows about this. There's video, surveillance video from in, in, inside, um, you know, the, the school uh, book. Um, you know, books that have been been written on, um, you know, Columbine, and it's just very well known. Some people are questioning. They're saying, did the fact that, you know, we did school drills, did that help uh, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold? Did we actually train them on how to attack the school? Because they they knew our drills. They knew where students would exit, how students would respond. And and they're, they're, these questions started to come up. And, and that didn't really happen before, and before Columbine. So people started to question Ooh, like, what do we really want to do for drills? Because we might be training the students who are going to then use these drills to attack us. And, and that was kind of, I thought, unusual logic. But I guess, I, you know, you, you can kind of see where that would happen. Because um, there was, maybe about five years ago, there was uh, a, a man who uh, wanted to find out how the fire department would respond to his house, had, had planned an ambush on a fire department. So had a, a test call, you know, the fire department responded and then he knew where the trucks would be, you know, and, and knew what the firefighters would do. And then at a, a later time actually called and then had an ambush and killed some of the firefighters. Um, so this, this isn't unusual in, in some aspects, but, but that really had a lot of schools kind of backpedaling of, of looking at their drills and questioning, well, how much do we let students in on these drills and how much do we don't? The reality is no, you're not you're not training your your students. You're not honing your students to then use these drills against you. But again, that that kind of came out. Many of these school attacks are planned out over months, which means that we have a chance to intervene if we notice anything is off. We have to remain vigilant 
about what is happening around us. Klebold and, and Harris, I mean, they practiced and, and thought about this for months, months, and and they were preparing. That's what we also see. Um, people prepare for these attacks. It's not something where it's heat of the moment. You know, there was an argument today at school or, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm angry because my girlfriend broke up with me, so now I'm going to come back. Those type of things do happen. If they do happen, they typically are very much one person directed at another person. But these mass attacks usually are, are very much thought out. You know, we're talking months, if not years. And it, and it was that way for Klebold and, and Harris. Um, their parents had questions. And, and, and there was a, there was a question, you know, with the police of if they would have gone one step further in saying, you know, we can we go into the house and, and look and see what's in the house that they would have discovered the bomb making materials and the manifestos and things like that. It would have ended right, right there. And, and, but yeah, it, it, it stopped. It didn't go that step further. Does prevention through threat reporting really work? During the last part of this episode, we will examine the similarities between the Columbine and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas attacks as it pertains to threat reporting. In the meantime, Dr. Perodin gives us an example of threat reporting working. Um, and I actually talked with, um, and I can't identify, you know, I, I do work as an expert witness with different cases and things, but I had actually talked with a police officer who was contacted by a parent um, saying, I have concerns about my son and some of his friends um, that they could be planning an attack on the school. The officer immediately responded to the home, um, found weapons found um, detailed plans and basically said, you know, had that parent not called and, you know, I, I went over to that house that night. Um, and, and it was strange because he said uh, later, like the kids actually said, we were just, I say kids, I mean, p potential murderers were actually saying we were hoping somebody would just unfold this, but we kind of got in too far and, and we felt like just the momentum of it was going to carry us through. And even Harris and Klebold had some run-ins where they kind of questioned each other and they tried to recruit additional students into this of saying, you know, do you want to, and, and yet this didn't come out, you know, this, this code of silence remains strong with students. Um, so they, they weren't completely sold, but again, when you have two people, um, it kind of diffuses that responsibility. And I think if either of them had been left to their own means, that probably wouldn't have happened. But, you know, with the two of them, again, it's like, well, you know, we made this pact. And, and again, it diffuses your responsibility and one person is supporting the other. The attack at Columbine changed how emergency responders approached an active situation. There are many stories of law enforcement waiting for hours to enter the building, even after the shooting had ceased. Some mechanical things as far as like a response to a school attack changed significantly with Columbine, significantly. So um, at Columbine, when the call started to come in that, that there were shooters in the school, the police responded and they, they took what was called the SWAT approach, which was typical at that time, meaning you waited until your SWAT team arrived and then your SWAT team would have a plan and enter the building. And that took a long time. It took a long time for that to happen. And also staging was really chaotic. There weren't interagency drills. So when, you know, parents were arriving, um, you know, ambulances, fire, they weren't sure where to park. Um, they had to re move vehicles at the same time. You have parents coming in, media. And this this still happens today. Um, and and that's something I, I, when I work with schools, I let schools know right away. The moment something goes down, um, especially today, you're going to have, you know, hundreds of kids texting out to their parents and saying, we're in lockdown. I hear shots, whatever. And you're going to have parents racing toward the school and all of this. So you have to be prepared for that, you know, that, that you're going to um, encounter this. But um, anyway, the SWAT approach took a lot of time. And also Columbine wasn't marked as far as the school you and i we drop our kids off at school and it's like this is entrance a this is entrance g and outside this window is you know it's window 22 this is you know and the reason they do that now 
is so you know you can identify f- from the exterior but then also you know a map of the school saying because the officers responding they're coming from all over this is an all call so you might have someone from um three villages away who's never been to this school and they're having to to work with somebody else um so they don't know the layout of the school even officers so so this was a way to you know columbine initially get this columbine was built as a warehouse the subdivision that eventually created columbine was 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 a venture you know it, it was a capitalist venture so it was a roll of the dice and if homes went up then that was great um and and if they didn't then this this would be a warehouse so it was built and it had all kind of sliding partitions and things it was really weird it even had a loading dock in the back and so it was it was like a yeah a school that could could be converted within a very short amount of time into a warehouse so it it didn't have also a really good layout and people too were confused because the blueprints were like well is this you know here's a sliding partition was that in place or is that not in place and those things those things got um uh, solidified throughout the country after this of of that's why we have now you know the numbers outside of the doors and things like that um and the SWAT approach is gone. People don't wait for that anymore. What happens is it's the first officers on scene. It should be at least two officers. Sometimes one will enter. That's really not protocol, but you know, in, in the heat of the moment, the best is four. Four, they can do what's called a diamond formation and they can sweep. And I've actually been involved in those um, where you, you actually do create a diamond shape. So you have, have one person, one officer looking in back, one in front and one on each side and they can enter a building and sweep. Now, those four officers, two might be local police, one might be state patrol, and one can be county. I mean, they're the first four there. Hopefully, they have their protective gear on, but sometimes not. They just go in the building. And the thought is you can neutralize the threat as, as much quicker this way because um, Klebold and Harris had had the reign of the building for quite a while. Um, and the fact is, once, once uh, an attacker is aware that law enforcement is in the building or for example it, it could be fire ems but it's going to be law enforcement someone's in the building um three things are going to happen one is they're going to surrender they're going to take their their own life or they're going to then try to engage that person so it's much better to engage a police officer you know that is trained and has a, a gun than trying to engage a first grader that has a pencil A coordinated response is critical in active shooter situations. Each agency should work synergistically in the attempt to minimize the loss of life. The attack at Columbine highlighted the disconnect between the agencies. And also interagency drills picked up after that because the fire department didn't know what to do when they they arrived. And eventually they they used one of their vehicles I, I don't know if it was a pumper or or it was a, a, a tanker, but they used it to move close to the building so they could have officers behind it. And and we think that interagencies play well together, and they don't. They to this day they don't almost everywhere, and they'll say that they do, but they don't. I call it multi-agency drills, not interagency drills. Um, and the the maybe one time a year that fire, EMS, and police get together. Um, you know, you know, for the for these drills at school, the, the fact is, um, you know, they they don't really, they don't interface well together. In Virginia Tech, for example, um, the at Norris Hall, um, after the shooting had concluded at Norris Hall, the the police were saying building is clean. Um, we need fire and EMS to come up, and fire and EMS were saying, no, we're not. We're we're, we're you know. We are not convinced that the site is secure. So the police actually took, um, I believe it was Chevy Tahoe's, brand new, and were transporting um, people that had been shot uh, a few blocks away to where police or where fire and EMS were staging. So um, eventually, you know, fire and EMS did did come up, but it wasn't immediate. And now you have something called like tactical EMS and tactical fire. This is kind of starting where they're they're actually training and they're wearing you know, like body armor and stuff like that. So, so they're ready to come in. Um, 
But actually, we go back to those those Chevys. Um, they were only a couple of weeks old, and they had to be destroyed because of the bodily fluids that had seeped into the seats, and they couldn't they couldn't save them. So, um, but yeah, it becomes very very territorial when news breaks that an active shooter is being reported at a local school. Our natural response is to rush over to that school to get our kids out of harm's way, at whatever the cost. This instinct provides a unique conundrum, because doing this prevents the emergency responders from doing their job effectively and efficiently as possible. This was evident at Columbine and Sandy Hook. Again, this is an all-call. We talked about it. So people from all over are, are, are coming in. So you can see the confusion. So one thing Columbine, when they got done with this, they tried to come out and, and say, we have to have better staging of resources when people are coming in because we couldn't get, you know, our, our additional police in, we couldn't get our um, EMS in. And the fact is, those problems still exist today. Same thing happened at Sandy Hook. Boom, the, the roads got congested. People would just stop at Sandy Hook. 2012, parents would, would drive up as far as they could and they would just jump out of their vehicle and start running. And and even the vehicle might just be there, you know, the, they wouldn't, idling. I mean, the doors open and they take off running to the school. So we still have this um, problem today where uh, it get, it gets to be very congested and very hard to bring resources into these types of scenes. It is interesting to note that Dr. Perodin talks about the failure of threat reporting mechanisms. He specifically mentions a system failure that perpetuates to this day. This was said last August and rang true this past Valentine's Day. What we start to see is not so much with, with you know, the, the Bath, Michigan, um, but, but we, we saw it with Brenda Spencer and now we see it with, with Columbine. Um, these, these very overt in, in forensic analysis um, warning signs that, that we would look and say, oh my goodness, this, 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 and this. And, and very much these, what, what's known as residue, um, existed. So as we move forward, I want us to keep thinking, too, of like how the question that needed to be asked at Columbine um, was what was the system for reporting and then also receiving and processing these threats? And, and that question to this day isn't asked very well or it's just assumed that a student will identify the threat, take it to an adult, and there'll be some proper um, investigation. And to this day, that that still largely doesn't exist. So these systems, you know, there was a system failure here, which perpetuates to this day. It is uncanny and prophetic what the doc just mentioned. Last week on Valentine's Day, this systematic failure was on full display. More on that in a bit. I think it's, it's, it's very fascinating here that, that Klebold and Harris, you know, they had part-time jobs, they were active in some school things. Um, and, and again, you know, as you said, people, people knew and people didn't report. So the question is, and it, it's still unanswered, the question is, the FBI does a great job in the Secret Service of of going in and writing very thorough, very detailed reports, hundreds of pages of of these things. But the question that's not asked is, what was the reporting system? How did you educate students and adults to the reporting system? And how did you investigate? Dr. Perodin shifts the focus of the discussion to threat reporting in the schools and how the student handbooks alone are not enough. Um, I don't know about you, but when I went to school, when I went to school, I was given the handbook as a freshman in high school. So I don't know, 1990, 86, what was it? Something like that back in the old days. So, um, and, and it was our school principal, we, we sat in the auditorium and uh, he said, okay, everybody take uh, the first page and they, they handed out pencils. Um, yeah, sign your name on the bottom. Okay, this acknowledges that you're responsible for everything in the handbook. It's your responsibility to read it, to understand it, and uh, rip that sheet out. And you need to, to you know, turn that in to whoever it is as you walk out. And that's it. That was it. No questions. 
you know, does anyone have a question? Do you understand what happens if you threaten somebody? If, if you feel that you're th- nothing, not anything like that. I mean, it, and that stuff still happens today. And even, even to the extent I've worked with school districts in the last couple of years and, uh, and, you know, I, I, I go through this and I, and they'll, I'll say, how do you know that people understand your threat input system? You know, like if, if they see that a, a, a peer might be posting something threatening or making threatening statements, that th- how do they get that into the system? Well, it's all detailed out in our handbook and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, but like, do you go through the handbook? Well, no, the parents says parents go through the handbook and the kiss, but I'm like, okay, but you have to be more explicit than that. Kids don't understand and no one looks at the handbook. I mean, come on, none of us do. I mean, um, and then I said, well, you know, what happened? Well, they're required to sign a, a sheet and then their parents are required. And I said, well, how many do that? And then pause, 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 but maybe a third. Do you follow up? No. And, and they go on to the next thing and, and not to, to fault administration because again, what's the odds of something like this happening? Not very high, but I'm saying, um, I'm, I'm for a much more aggressive, um, overt approach to educating uh, students about the student handbook, especially harassment and, and bullying, being very, very explicit on, on talking about that. So I asked Dr. Perodin if he believes that if law enforcement would have intervened, would things have been different? Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. Uh, Dave Cullen um, denotes that in his book. Um, I don't think law enforcement ever, you know, comes out and, and overtly says that. But, but um, had there been an intervention and discovery at that time, it probably would have ended. We we know that too. That that if these things are discovered um, in the developmental stages, you know, that that's that's usually it. I mean, um, then the 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 students, re- well, you know. The legal system comes in, and then also if there's mental health treatment that needs to, to happen with treatment with with students and so forth. But um, typically, once that happens, it's not like then the students reset and come back and and will carry out the attack. It's like um, when I was telling that story of that police officer who said, you know, he he came in, in to that family's home and, and found these things, and then he met with the, these kids, and the kids actually said. Finally, they said, we, we, we actually thank you for doing this. Like we, you know, and they were, you know, they were being taken off to jail, but they said, you know, we would have done this had you not come in. And, and I've read several thwarted cases where people, um, you know, it's like, like somebody who's standing on the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, you know, I, I, I watched a, a documentary and, you know, some of the people who did not jump, um, said, you know, they, they just waited and waited and hoped somebody would ask them, how are you doing? Um, is there anything I can do to help you? And, and just to have that connection. And, and that's big, too. Uh, school connectedness is is a concept. It's the Centers for Disease Control has an entire detailed website about it, connecting kids to kids, connecting kids to school, the impact that that has. It's funny because I, I even, even in the mail service, you know, uh, a mail carrier might be the only person that somebody sees their entire day and, and and they'll talk about just the mail carriers will talk about what an impact they have on people's lives. People will come out and, and you know, that, that two minutes they might talk to them or something like that. So it's one of these things, if someone would have intervened, yeah, definitely. I, I don't think this would have happened. Dr. Perodin summarizes the lessons learned from the Columbine school attack. So in closing in that, I think, you know, the, uh, you know, two big, two big things came out as one is the approach, the SWAT approach went by the wayside. And it was the first uh, police on the scene go in and try to neutralize the, the threat. And, and the second one too, is thinking of Klebold and Harris. I, I mean, they had, they had jobs. They, they worked together, you know, one at the, at Blackjack Pizza, um, you know, one was a shift manager. They attended some school events. So, you know, who would have who would have thought that, you know, also. So you might think immediately, you know, you're thinking disconnect it, you know, out of school, heads, you know, looking down in the hallway, not making eye contact and loner. And and that really wasn't that really wasn't the case. And, and people interviewed, too, would they asked, you know, where, where would you have see, imagined them five, 10 years from now? And they're like, you know, probably in college, you know, graduate from college, something in computer or something in engineering. They were pretty sharp in those areas. They had high aptitude, you know, stuff like that. So. 
after I read uh, Dave Cullen's book, I had no doubt that had they not gone down this this path, they would have blossomed in you know the engineering or computer sciences fields. Uh, they they definitely have the aptitude for it. Up next, we are going to take a look at the eerie similarities that exist between the school attack on Columbine and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High Schools. There is no doubt that you've already been exposed to the stats about the number of shootings that have already occurred this year. For example, the number being reported by multiple news media is 18. However, according to USA Today, the actual number is 6. The count of 18 includes any discharge of a firearm, including accidents that took place in a school, whether students were involved or not. In eight of those 18, no one was injured or killed. Two of them were suicides that occurred on school grounds. I don't mention this to minimize the fact that this is happening, because at a count of six school shootings this year, That is still, on average, one per week. I just want you to be aware that we need to know exactly what we're dealing with in order to address this situation at hand. We do ourselves a disservice if we regurgitate stats without providing context. We need to take it upon ourselves to be socially responsible. Furthermore, we will be told that we need more stringent screening processes for those who buy guns that we need more gun laws to prevent certain guns from being available, that mental illness is a cause. We will be provided with simple solutions to a very complex problem that requires a multifaceted approach. But the reality is that there is a unique set of circumstances that have culminated into someone taking the lives of so many innocent people for one or all of the aforementioned reasons. Awareness requires that we ask ourselves the right questions and not to accept the eye-catching headlines at face value. For the rest of this episode, we are going to focus on the similarities of the events leading up to these tragedies, specifically the failures of those whose job it is to protect us, to protect us from those who want to do harm to our friends and our family. It has been 19 years since Columbine, yet we continue to make the same mistakes. As we continue with the next part of this episode, keep in mind this quote from George Santana. Quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. End quote. Stay tuned. We begin our program with broken hearts in yet another American town, which today became the site of yet another deadly school shooting. A high school in Parkland, Florida, became the scene of chaos and panic just before the end of the school day. The Broward County Sheriff says at least 17 people are dead. 17 people. A suspect is alive in custody. As is our policy on this program, we will not say his name or show you his picture. We'll update you on the investigation, certainly, and as information comes in over the next two hours. But as always, and as happens too often, we'll keep our focus on the victims, their loved ones, and the survivors. High school kids, teachers, parents, brothers and sisters, people whose lives were lost or forever changed this afternoon, people who tonight have joined a terrible and a senseless club, one that grows by the weak in this country.
Right now, we're going to show you a short video taken inside a classroom during the shooting. Difficult to watch. It is difficult to listen to. We blurred the faces of the students. If you are sensitive to gun violence, skip ahead 30 seconds, as you may find this very disturbing. I will play this clip because here on this podcast, I believe that true awareness comes from facing the harshest realities of the human spirit so that we may learn from it. Holy At this point, we don't know all the facts of this school attack. So we are not going to examine what happened until all the information is released. However, there are some facts we do know. We know about the law enforcement response to the events leading up to the Valentine's Day attack. And we will examine those now. We have uncovered at the Broward Sheriff's Office that we've had approximately 20 calls for service over the last few years regarding the killer. We will continue to follow up as we do with any investigation. We want to try and find out why this killer did what he did, what we could learn for it, and how we could keep our kids safe moving forward. So every one of these calls for service will be looked at and scrutinized. If we find out, like in, in any investigation, that one of our deputies or call takers could have done something better or was remiss, I'll handle it accordingly. At this time, I'd like to bring up Rob Lasky, Special in uh, Agent in Charge of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Good afternoon. Have you seen Earlier today, the FBI released a statement regarding information provided to our public access line on January 5th of this year. The caller provided information about Nicholas Cruz and the potential of him becoming a school shooter. Under normal protocol, this information should have been provided to the Miami field office. Their appropriate investigative steps would have been taken. The FBI has determined that protocol was not followed. The information was not provided to the Miami field office and no further investigation was conducted at that time. The FBI is still investigating the facts of this situation. We will conduct an in-depth review of our internal procedures for responding to information that is provided by the public. The FBI remains dedicated to keeping the American people safe. On behalf of myself and over 1,000 employees of the Miami field office, we truly regret any additional pain that this has caused. In the coming weeks and months, information will be released about the calls for service. The questions you should be asking yourselves, did any of those calls allow the officers to intervene? to investigate further, to possibly uncover the social media postings and the fact that the attacker had a gun capable of committing a mass killing. Columbine provides a reference point from which to compare. The news show 60 Minutes conducted a six month investigation of the events leading up to the attack. Listen to the details carefully and you will hear some strikingly similar events. As Jefferson County school and police officials will tell you, it's awfully easy for outsiders to look at the Columbine tragedy and conclude it didn't have to happen. But in our six month investigation, we spoke to a number of people, insiders, people with firsthand knowledge of the events leading up to Columbine, who told us the killings might have been prevented. A year before the attack, Joe Schaumoser and Howard Cornell were worried that Columbine was just the kind of place where a school shooting might happen. 
Hicks. They were in charge of security for the school district that included Columbine. After the shootings in Paducah, Kentucky and Jonesboro, Arkansas, they were afraid that one of their schools might be next. Did you find any common elements? In this? Oh, yes. In fact, if you're in a white, suburban, middle class, fairly large, complex school, you'd better have a plan for violence and threats of violence. That's exactly what they had, a plan. In August of 98, a full eight months before the attack on Columbine, Cornell and Shalmoza wrote a security plan that required school officials to notify and meet with parents and law enforcement officers as soon as they learned of a threat by any student to commit any act of violence. They say Columbine didn't follow the plan. And how did you propose that the schools identify students who might be a problem? It's when a sophomore or even a freshman says, I'm going to kill somebody and I've got a gun at home to do it, or I'm going to, I'm going to blow the place up, it's time to trigger this procedure and take action. In the event that the kid initiates some behavior that pops one of those red flags up, then we need to move. About the time Cornell and Shalmosa presented their security plan to Columbine, two of the school's juniors, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, were coming to the attention of school and law enforcement authorities. At night, Harris and Klebold had been building an arsenal and making plans to use it, plans that Harris wrote about on the Internet on his website. Our first true pipe bombs blew big, Harris writes. God, I can't wait till I can kill you people. I don't care if I live or die in the shootout. You all better hide in your houses because I'm coming for everyone soon, and I will be armed to the teeth, and I will shoot to kill, and I will kill everything. Brooks Brown was also a junior at Columbine in 1998. That March, he found his name on Harris's website. Harris was threatening to kill him. When I first saw the web pages, I was utterly blown away. He's not saying like he's going to beat me up. He's saying he wants to blow me up, and he's talking about how he's making the pipe bombs to do it with. He specifically states that he wants to kill Brooks, specifically states that they are making and detonating pipe bombs. Did you see Brooks' this? parents, Randy and Judy Brown, say they were horrified by the website and frightened of Harris, who lived nearby. They decided to take pages from the website to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, where an investigator told them that Harris already had a criminal file. He and Dylan Klebold were on a form of probation for breaking into a van and stealing equipment. So he knew that Eric Harris had broken into this van? Yes. So he, the same Eric Harris right, who made death threats that. against your son? Absolutely, he knew that. You went to them and said, here's a red flag. More than a red flag, here were three felonies that we had turned into them, making and detonating pipe bombs and threatening my son's life, and they didn't pursue it. They didn't do their job. I was utterly dumbfounded that they did nothing with the web pages. Eric was saying how he was going to blow people up. Hey, I'm making pipe bombs. I've got the designs for them on my website. Um, I'm going to kill these people. Here's why. That's a level beyond making a joke. At first, the sheriff's department denied its investigators had even met with the Browns in person. But we obtained this police paperwork showing those investigators not only met with Mrs. Judy Brown, but then worked on a warrant to search Eric Harris's home. Even more surprising, this document shows a sheriff's deputy found a pipe bomb consistent with the devices Harris described on his website. But the sheriff's department never searched or even visited the Harris home. It was April of 98, a full year before the Columbine massacre. People are covering up everything that went wrong, and I want these lessons out there. They're doing studies, they're getting profiles, everybody's trying to, to get programs going and what we can do. Well, guess what? All the signs were there. You know what the lessons are? Do your job. After their meeting with the Browns, sheriff's deputies did warn administrators at Columbine that Eric Harris might be making pipe bombs. But according to a school district official, Sally Blanchard, the school had no reason to look into the matter further. Deans were told that there was an investigation underway, that they weren't to do anything, that it was informational on their part only. So they actually took no action because certainly they wouldn't have wanted to interfere with an ongoing investigation. This is too important to say, oh, well, you're going to handle it. We'll, 
we'll get on to something else. It's too much too important. But isn't it fair to say that if the police come to the school and say, hey, we're investigating this kid because the kid's making pipe bombs. This is an FYI, so you know what's going on. That if, if I'm the school, I'm, I'm assuming that, okay, the cops are taking care of it. No. You have to get the cop in there and say, what do you mean he's making pipe bombs? And where are they? And what is he doing with them? If a sheriff's deputy told you that somebody at your school was messing around with pipe bombs, wouldn't, I mean, just common sense, wouldn't you want to know more about that? I would have asked, first of all, if there was something that would lead me to believe that I needed to worry about our students in our school. There's not much else I could do other than have the information and be watching, being more vigilant about that student. But if Columbine's administrators were being more vigilant about Eric Harris, they admit that didn't include speaking to his teachers, family, or friends about him. One of those friends, Nate Dykeman, told us Harris and Klebold were showing off their weapons to people long before they attacked Columbine. One day, Eric showed you a, a pipe bomb at his home. Yes. What'd you say? I was kind of taken back. I, I, this, things were starting to get kind of out of hand. I, you know, making little fireworks is one thing, but when you make things that can like blow half your body apart, that's, that's out of most normal people's league. <laughs> Dykeman says Harris also kept what he called a hit list. It was a little list of paper that he had kept in his wallet, um, just a list of names. He, he would update every day if somebody shoved them or somebody called them something, he would write their name down on it. He was just a scary kid. <laughs> Devin Adams was a sophomore at Columbine in 1998 when she found her name on Harris's website on his hit list. In December of 98, you went to an assistant principal at the school and told her that you had been threatened by Eric Harris. Yes. What did you say to her? I told her that Eric was intimidating, that he was threatening, that other students were feeling threatened by him. They did not feel safe in school around him, that it was not a safe environment when he was around. And what did you want her to do? What did you think she would do? I wanted her to call Eric in maybe call his parents and just talk to him. And? And I don't think it ever happened. But that assistant principal denies Devin Adams ever spoke to her about Eric Harris. I made an appointment, sat down, and I talked to her. I was serious, and she should have known that. That was December. By then, Klebold and Harris had already bought a rifle, a semi-automatic pistol, and two sawed-off shotguns. Referring to a popular video game, Harris said in a tape he made before the shooting, that shotgun is straight out of Doom. It's going to be like Doom. In the video games that we all played, the sawed-off shotgun, that was their favorite weapon. According to Nate Dykeman, Harris and Klebold even made videotapes of themselves shooting their guns and played those tapes in school. They were editing it in our video productions class. What did you think that they were going to, to do with these these guns. They had told me that it was for target practice. I mean, but you don't I, I, use a sawed-off shotgun for target yeah, practice. Yeah, you don't. And that was odd, but they, Eric was an extreme person. All of these things that people are pointing to now as, as red flags, the video in the classroom, the, the pipe bombs, the guns. I figured if, if teachers are seeing this and numerous students are seeing all these signs, somebody else should be you know, worried about this. If, if nobody else is, is seeing anything wrong with this, you know, why should I? School officials say because of pending lawsuits, they cannot disclose whether any teachers saw videotapes of Harris and Klebold's guns. What people saw in the school were that these two were going to classes every day. They had friends. They were turning in assignments. They were working towards higher grades in their classes. They were planning a future and going to the college or to the military. And they're blowing up pipe bombs, they're shooting off shotguns. Are there other students doing that in your school? I don't know. Should you know? Would you want to know? I would certainly want to know. Should you have known then? Should someone have known? Again, within what was happening... But that's it, what's it, happening, Ms. Blanchard. I mean, does the school take any responsibility for failing to see how dangerous they might be? There was no one in that school who had any indication that these two boys would become mass murderers. 
In February of 99, Dylan Klebold turned in a story he wrote about an assassin in a black trench coat who shoots down students and bombs the city. The man unloaded one of the pistols across the fronts of the four innocents, Klebold wrote. The streetlights caused a visible reflection off of the droplets of blood. I understood his actions. Klebold's teacher later called it the most vicious story she'd ever read and voiced her concerns about it to Klebold's parents and his school counselor. But no school official ever looked into the matter, and it ended there. It was two months before the shootings. According to Howard Cornell, that story gave Columbine's administrators yet another opportunity to head off Klebold and Harris. And yet again, they missed it. In any of these instances, the essay that was written, the police investigating the pipe bombs, the girl who felt that, that she was threatened, in any of these instances, did Columbine follow the policies that you had laid out for the school district? No, not one. Why do you think Columbine didn't implement your recommendations? I don't know the answer to that, Mr. Bradley. We asked school district officials that question, and in a letter, they said Cornell and Schaumoser's plan applied only when a district employee becomes aware of a student who threatens to kill someone, a standard they say didn't apply to Harris or Klebold. But that's not what the plan says. Here's what it does say. The plan goes into effect when a student threatens to kill another student or commit any act of violence. And that standard did apply to Eric Harris. Where were Harris and Klebold's parents all this time? In police interviews, they said they had no idea about the arsenal of weapons their sons were amassing in their bedrooms, including knives, guns, cans full of gunpowder, coils of bomb fuse, and bombs more than a hundred of them, including pipe bombs, propane bombs, and homemade grenades. At night, while their parents were asleep, Harris and Klebold made videotapes in which they talked about all the weapons they had. Harris imagined his parents saying, if only we had checked his room, if only we had asked more questions. So is it possible that threat reporting systems and follow-up investigations can suppress an attack? Dr. Perodin gave us one example. But did you know that just one day before the Valentine's Day attack, a plot to attack a school was thwarted by a grandmother? On February 13th, 2018, at approximately 9.30 a.m., Catherine O'Connor called 911 to report her grandson. What I'm reporting is I'm finding um, journal entries from my grandson, uh -huh. um, and he's planning to um, have a mass shooting at one of the high schools, and I wanted to talk to somebody about that. Okay. Um, I can advise another officer for you and have them call you. Okay. Okay, and they, if, when they do call, it will be a blocked or restricted number, so just make sure you answer that when they do call. O'Connor's grandson, who will not be named here, planned on attacking Aces High School in Everett, Washington. Police found a journal with an entry on April 19th, and that was circled. Police alleged that this date was important to the attacker, because the Columbine High School attack took place on April 20th, and the Oklahoma City bombing took place on April 19th. In a page titled, Outline for Aces Massacre. The attacker details step by step how he planned to carry out the attack, including the time of day. The steps include, quote, bring gear and weapons, wait till lunch, wait two to three minutes after lunch bell and go to the gym back doors by the student parking, put zip ties on the door handles so B can escape, set pressure bomb cooker by bleachers with most students. Walk out of the gym and zip tie the gym doors by Tom's history class. As soon as FTP bomb goes off, start shooting spree and start music. Throw pipe bomb and smoke bomb in office. Mow kids down in hallway and gym. Kill yourself at the end 
of make a change. End quote. Prosecutors allege that the attacker had inert grenades in his bedroom and that he planned to fill it with black powder, along with an AK-47 rifle hidden in a guitar case. This is what it looks like when the threat reporting system works. Yeah, good morning to you, Joyce. We're lucky to be here live this morning with Police Chief Dan Templeman here in Everett. Obviously, Chief, uh, you and your detectives officers took this threat very, very seriously. First off, can you give us the latest on this case and what we know so far? Sure. Uh, so we continue to investigate this, this case, and as you just mentioned, any sort of threat like this in our schools and in our community, we take very serious, make it a top priority. So. We have mobilized our entire major crimes unit, as well as resources from pretty much every other investigative unit we have in our department to investigate this. We've conducted search warrants, continue to do that, and wanna make sure that we collect all the evidence that we can, talk to uh, all the witnesses and, and anybody that may have information and uh, put together a strong case and investigation. Right, and obviously this is so much more top of mind now, given what we've seen in Florida, which is just so terrible. Have you beefed up any security at all at ACES High School today? Well, yeah, uh, we have. We've added a, a police officer into the school, and so uh, we wanna make sure that, that the students and staff and, and parents that have students that attend that school feel safe and secure, and so we really believe that by adding that police officer presence, we can accomplish that. And Chief, it was the grandmother of this boy, this teenager, who saw something, saw these journal entries, thought they were serious enough to call your officers. What is the importance here in your eyes? What's the lesson learned here? Well, this is really critical part of this whole equation, Jake. And that is, you know, and we've heard this before, if you see something, say something. If you see some, if you hear something, say something. And that could not be more true today. And, and what we find in a lot of these cases is that after an incident like this does occur or a shooting like what we saw in Florida, information starts to develop where we determine or we find that uh, family members, witnesses, other students may have seen something on social media, may have heard something, and for whatever reason, you know, talk themselves out of reporting it. And so it's just critical. And it, in, in some cases, it may take courage, you know, yeah. if it's a family member to report this, but it's absolutely critical today that if you if you see something that's not right, you see threats on social media, yeah. that you report it to a school official, to an adult, or to law enforcement. Could be saving lives. Could Absolutely. Saving lives. Absolutely. When a community works together vigilantly to protect our friends and family, we can suppress attacks from happening. Working together in this way doesn't pin the pro-gun against the anti-gun proponents. This is something that a community can do now while we figure out the bigger issues. Let Catherine O'Connor and the Everett Police Department be an example to us all. As we close on the story of Columbine, we saw that our preparedness for dealing with these attacks has improved. Our tactics when responding to these events has evolved. We might not be able to solve the hot topic issues, but what we know for sure is that we need to start with the basics. We need to be vigilant. And when that vigilance pays off in the form of notifying our law enforcement officials, then they need to take heed and step in when necessary. It is crucial that leads are followed up on because lives are at stake. Whether it's a lack of training, lack of manpower, lack of funding, or all of the above, we need to fix it. Because that's our first line of defense. Gun laws, fortification of our schools, and screening practices should all be evaluated so that we can determine the best course of action going forward. The solution should be a multi-layered solution, and we must tackle these in manageable chunks identify the quick wins, and implement the solutions, then move on to the next. We heard a couple of stories where vigilance and threat reporting worked, but threat reporting is only as good 
as the people in charge with following up on that report. We now know that a breakdown in this support system has catastrophic results. So as we see the updates about the 2018 Valentine's Day school attack, and as we're bombarded with the information, keep in mind that law enforcement failed to respond. No one can possibly know if this attack could have been prevented if the reporting had worked. But I guess we'll never know. And that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again to Dr. David Perodin for coming on this show to give us guidance on these school attacks. And if you haven't heard already, Dr. Perodin interviewed me on his show, The Safety Doc Podcast, episode 61. We spent over two hours discussing grooming. The link to the interview will be in the show notes. Check it out. You can find all of Dr. Perodin's contact information at awarenesspodcast.com forward slash guests. In two weeks, we will continue our discussion with Dr. Perodin on school attacks. Thanks to Shane Yoder and his team at PutThemInASong.com for the theme music and Ed Luby for the awareness logo. And thanks to my family for allowing me to do this. Without your support, this would not be possible. Until we meet again, stay engaged and stay aware. I'll talk to you soon.